Hello, everyone. All right. My comments today, I'm calling Winning Suffrage the Texas Story. In 2020, we're going to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, as we all know, to the Constitution. The language of that amendment was simple. Basically, it said, the right to vote can't be denied on account of sex. That was 1920, and that's the first time that the word sex appeared in the Constitution. <laughs> of course, in this case, it really meant woman because the assumption that all, votes, uh, that all voters were white men was baked into the Constitution from the start. So I want to describe some of what it took for that little three-letter word to appear in our most revered document and what Texas had to do with it. It wasn't easy, and it wasn't quick. In fact, the upshot of my story is that the suffrage movement didn't end with the 19th Amendment. It's still going on. Despite what you may have learned, not all women got the vote in 1920. The people who didn't, as we've already heard, were Native American women and people of color, mostly from the South, whose civil rights continued to be denied for nearly 100 years after Reconstruction. Not until the 1965 Voting Rights Act did African Americans achieve the unfettered right to vote because through this act, the federal government took the power to determine who could vote away from the states and put it in the, the federal government's hands instead. The Voting Rights Act worked well until 2013 when the Supreme Court removed one of its most important requirements. As a result, serious errors, uh, serious, efforts still, serious efforts still prevent people from voting. So the suffrage movement isn't over. But when did it begin? Many people point to the convention at Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, but I think the push for suffrage started much earlier in ways that are hard to document because they were informal. Like the abolition of slavery, winning the vote was a social revolution, and I think its seeds were sown during the American Revolution. We know that thinkers from this period valued self-government, and the wisdom of people over kings. Our Constitution declared boldly that we, the people, were in charge. And people were called citizens, not subjects. They made their voices heard by voting. But there was a catch to that. Voting was reserved for landed white men. Despite Enlightenment thinkers' respect for democracy, hierarchies of gender, race, and class were well enough in place Abigail Adams told her husband John in so many words, all men would be tyrants if they could. And if attention is not paid to the ladies, we will foment a rebellion and declare ourselves unbound by any laws that don't include us. As we know, she was ignored and <laughs> women were not included in the Constitution. So women back then were asking about their place in this new democracy even comparing themselves to enslaved people. This is one reason so many women allied themselves with the abolition movement. By 1848, enough feminists and abolitionists, black and white, believed in equal rights for women that they called that convention at Seneca Falls, New York. With Elizabeth Cady Stanton's famous Declaration of Sentiments, which was modeled on the Declaration of Independence, they listed 16 different rights that women deserve to have, and one of them was the vote. Abolitionists and feminists cooperated through the Civil War, and the two biggest names in that coalition were Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Frederick Douglass. They all wanted to free the slaves and grant them civil rights, and they wanted equal rights for women, too. Now, after the war was over in 1865, they got a lot of what they wanted, the 13th Amendment outlawed slavery, and then the 14th Amendment in 1868 gave citizenship to free people, and then the 15th Amendment granted the right to vote to freed men. But the realization among some white women 
that African American men had been granted the vote before they had was infuriating and everything blew up. In 1869, the coalition split into two competing groups that focused entirely on suffrage. Frederick Douglass's group supported the 15th Amendment and universal suffrage for men and women, black and white. Elizabeth Cady Stanton's group opposed ratification of the 15th Amendment and supported what she called educated woman suffrage for white women only. To Stanton, the 15th Amendment was what she said, she, the word she used was an abomination that created antagonism between what she called educated, refined women and the lower orders of men, especially in the South. She and Susan B. Anthony said worse things than this throughout their lives, but theirs was the organization that eventually prevailed, and they led the nationwide suffrage movement. The attitudes they carried with them infected the movement through 1920. But at this point, we need to ask, <laughs> what about Texas? What was going on in Texas all this time? As we know, Anglo colonists from the South came into the region when it was still Mexico, bringing their slaves with them. They rebelled against Mexico, mostly over the right to own slaves. And they won and declared their independence and became a republic, which of course then became the state of Texas. At each state, uh, stage, Texans wrote their own constitutions, which protected slavery, allowed only Anglos to be citizens, and allowed only men to vote. Then Texas fought in the war with Mexico, which ended the same year as the Seneca Falls Convention. So now we've caught up to that date. Then Texas, of course, seceded from the Union and fought the Civil War, and we know how that worked out. <laughs> During Reconstruction, Texas had to rewrite its constitution to be readmitted to the Union. At the Constitutional Convention, some of the delegates were former slaves, and in the spirit of that progress, a former slave owner proposed that the new constitution should allow women to vote. Of course, it was defeated in a flurry of arguments about politics being too dirty for wives and mothers. <laughs> but news of the proposal reached Stanton and Anthony, who wrote with surprise and hope that, my God, Texas has been reached. <laughs> Proposals for woman suffrage were voted on 10 more times in Texas. And guess what? They all failed. Because really, all state legislators were men, and most of them just wouldn't agree to enfranchise women unless it would help them accomplish their own goals. At the same time, that it overcame their belief that women in politics just should never mix. That rare combination wasn't possible until 1918, during the Progressive Era. But that was another 50 years away. So back to the 19th century. When Reconstruction ended in 1876, so did federal enforcement of socially progressive Republican laws like civil rights for former slaves, which were considered radical by conservative Texas Democrats. What replaced Reconstruction was the old pre-Civil War system of racial apartheid and gendered social roles that came to be known as Jim Crow. This was an authoritarian system that, simply put, reinforced white male supremacy. Challenging it was difficult and it was dangerous. States controlled all aspects of voting and the Texas Democratic Party enforced it. Educated white suffragists, although excluded from any party power, had access to powerful men through their relationships with them. In addition, they held privileged positions over people of color. In this Texas, African Americans were disfranchised again, as they had been before the 15th Amendment. One historian friend of mine has suggested that the suffrage movement wouldn't have been possible without this disfranchisement. Because racism and sexism required the separation of white women from black men, white Texas suffragists could not 
and would not advocate for suffrage for black men or even black women. Because the reasoning went, they would, have to, they would be forced to mingle together at the polls. This was a manufactured, fear-based, untrue argument that played on white fear of freed black people, but it worked. Eventually, Texas instituted the white primary, which allowed only white people to vote. And the woman's suffrage bill that finally passed in 1918 applied only to women's rights to vote in the primary election. In addition to this racial caste system, a gender and, and class hierarchy existed in Jim Crow, Texas. White males were at the top, followed by white females, then men of color, and then women of color. Prosperous Anglo women were the least constrained by white male supremacy, but their gender marked them as subordinate to white men. As a result, there were many Anglo women who opposed women's suffrage and believed that the vote would unsex them. That was the word they used to use. It would unsex them. Within the context of Jim Crow then, people were siloed, segregated in virtually every way by law, custom, prejudice, and the terrorism of the KKK. Not surprisingly, progress toward the vote in the second half of the 19th century was painfully slow. The state was big, rural, poor, and poorly educated. Texans lived in what has been called island communities that were self-sufficient and separated. And they, this didn't really begin to change until the spread of railroads in the 1870s and 80s, which contributed to urban growth that fostered better education and the formation of women's membership organizations. Suffragists used the railroads to take them to hard to reach towns. Elizabeth Cady Stanton came to Texas on a speaking tour in 1874 and five, and an Iowa suffragist named Mariana Folsom moved to Texas in 1884 and took it upon herself to travel the state, making pro-suffrage speeches for the next 25 years. She rode from town to town, giving out pamphlets and talking to whomever would listen, making as many as 200 speeches on her own in a year, and writing to national suffrage leaders about what was going on. She became something of a celebrity. Local and pro-suffrage newspapers reported what she said. People came back to hear her again and again, and then talked to others about her. She and others like her caused grassroots change, like public discussion and debates and suffrage pet petitions. In addition, the Grange and the People's Party and unions supported suffrage. And especially important was the appearance of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in Texas. That's the, that's the response that the WCTU often gets. Um, it was, but it was an important voice for social reform and women's rights, especially for women whose husbands were violent alcoholics. Their volunteers were taught how to advocate for prohibition, and they quickly understood that winning the right to vote could advance their cause and other issues that benefited women, too. The National WCTU endorsed suffrage in 1888. It was the first major organization to do that. And that was a huge boost to the cause. As its chapter spread, numbers of suffragists grew. And by 1890, those two suffrage organizations, back in 1869, that had split up after that big blow up, they came together as the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which I will just shorten to the national as we keep going. Other women's organizations of all kinds spread fast enough that a statewide federation formed to coordinate them. Among women of Mexican descent, there were self-help groups called mutualistas, and African-American women formed their own colored chapters of the WCTU and women's clubs and suffrage clubs. The spread of such groups taught, many, uh, taught all of these women many skills, not only encouraging like-minded women to meet together in spaces outside their homes, but also organizing, advocating, and speaking in public. By 1893, the first statewide suffrage organization appeared. It was segregated and supported the vote for white women only, of course, 
And with a few exceptions, that pretty much prevented Anglos and women of color from joining forces at the local level. Regionally, most Southern white women still supported Confederate values that were rooted in a kind of um, modern version of feudalism. They were suspicious of federalism, believed in states' rights, and didn't approve of a suffrage amendment to the Constitution, which the National believed was a more efficient strategy than going state by state to get suffrage passed. In other words, at the turn of the 20th century, the suffrage movement had achieved a nationwide identity but it was still getting itself together in the South. Not surprisingly, Texas's first statewide organization fell apart. In addition, the first generation of suffragists was dying off at the turn of the century. Elizabeth Cady Stanton died in 1902 and Susan B. Anthony in 1906. New national leaders needed southern states to get that suffrage amendment ratified. So national leaders made a lot of trips to Texas in the first decade of the 20th century. Texas was becoming important to them. Meanwhile, the conservative wing of the Texas Democratic Party was solidifying its control. It introduced a poll tax and new election regulations that reduced the power of Republicans and took the vote away from African Americans, Mexican Americans, and working class white voters. The sad truth was that voting in Texas at this time was filled with fraud. In reality, only white elite males voted their own minds. Of course, no women could vote, and although African American men could vote in a few East Texas counties where they and the Republican Party were still in the majority, the Democratic Party made it virtually impossible for, their to, for, for them to vote anywhere else, and then they also stole, that, stole votes in those black majority counties and applied them to their own candidates. As for Mexican immigrants, those who applied for citizenship were allowed to vote, even if they never followed through and became citizens. And that was because South Texas's Anglo ranch bosses routinely rounded up Mexican American male workers, citizens and non-citizens alike, and took them to the polls and instructed them how to vote in the ranchers' interests. Given this situation, the national director, Carrie Chapman Catt, concluded that the only group left to focus on in Texas was elite white women. So she decided to make suffrage socially acceptable by attracting the right kind of women leaders, middle and upper income Anglo women with no controversies in their past who were Democrats. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that was Texas for you. She called this the society plan, and she personally persuaded three women, one after the other, to lead the new statewide organization called the Texas Equal Suffrage Association. First was Annette Finnegan of Houston, and then, as we've already heard, Eleanor Brackenridge of San Antonio, and finally, the political genius of the group, Minnie Fisher Cunningham of Galveston, who took over in 1915. She was called Minnie Fish, and she was the daughter of an old East Texas plantation family that had fallen on hard times after the Civil War. Well-educated and a reformed Democrat, she was the first Texas woman trained as a pharmacist. She wasn't wealthy, but she knew Texas politics from her daddy's knee because he had been in the legislature. And after the devastating 1900 hurricane, she had learned how to organize women in Galveston to get access to clean milk for the children. She was moderate in her racial attitudes, but one story in particular reveals some real realities about the times. There was an African-American suffragist who was also active in the NAACP in El Paso, and her name was Maud Sampson. She wrote to the National asking to affiliate her El Paso club with them, but of course the National didn't allow African-American clubs to do that. Carrie Chapman Catt told the Texas chapter that only it could approve that affiliation, but then told Cunningham to tell Sampson that she should not embarrass everybody by applying for it in the first place. Cunningham was in the middle, and she finally told Sampson that since her application was the first of its kind, 
A decision just couldn't be made until the Texas group's annual convention, by which time she hoped the federal amendment would have been passed. While this evasion was a convenient excuse at best, it at least revealed Cunningham's decision not to insult Maud Sampson by repeating the denigrating comment that Carrie Catt had suggested that she use. Now, despite the racism underlying this whole episode, it also illustrated the careful strategies that Cunningham used as the leader of the Texas movement in its later years. Okay, in 1917, yet another resolution supporting women's suffrage in primary elections only came before the legislature, and once again, it died. This could have meant the end of this whole suffrage campaign in Texas because the governor was James Ferguson, the corrupt, anti-suffrage, anti-prohibition, conservative Democrat who was not gonna be persuaded to vote for votes for women. He had launched a purely political attack against pro progressive faculty members at the University of Texas. He demanded their dismissal, and he threatened members of the Board of Regents with replacement if they didn't comply. So the Regents fired the faculty. Many Fish responded by forming the Woman's Campaign for Good Government to educate the public about Ferguson's lack of fitness for office, complete with a big public rally in Austin. Ferguson then vetoed the university budget, and the ex-students association responded with a well-organized campaign to remove him from office. The campaign worked, Ferguson was impeached, the fired faculty were reappointed, and waiting in the wings to become governor was the more moderate lieutenant governor, William P. Hobby. Now being a practical man, Hobby was neither pro nor anti-suffrage at this moment, and Cunningham knew it. But she also knew that no politician was going to vote against his own interest. So when Jim Ferguson announced in 1918 that he was going to run for governor again, Cunningham and her colleagues told Hobby that if he would resurrect and support that failed primary woman suffrage bill, then newly enfranchised women would vote for him for governor. In thanks, Hobby added the suffrage bill to a special session that he had called. Cunningham then made the same deal with an influential pro-suffrage member of the Texas House named Metcalf. If he would lobby his colleagues, because no women could go into the legislature and lobby, so if he would do it, she would get suffragists to vote for Hobby. The primary suffrage bill did pass, and Governor Hobby was pressured, of course, to veto it. But knowing now that his election for governor was at stake, given what Cunningham had promised him, he signed that bill on March 26, 1918. As you can imagine, there was much joy and jubilation, and suffragists started forming Hobby for Governor clubs. But this isn't really the end of the story. Cunningham and her cohorts had only 16 days to register women to vote in the upcoming primary if they wanted to keep their end of the bargain with Hobby. So they mobilized throughout the state. Imagine the looks on the faces of county registrars when thousands of women like these showed up to register, including African American and Mexican American women, most of whom were turned away because the primary was open only to white voters. But they did it. They registered over 386,000 women to vote. <laughs> in two weeks, and there was no internet. <laughs> in the end, Hobby won the election because of the number of votes cast by all those white women who voted for the first time. In 1919, an attempt to amend the Texas Constitution to allow women to vote in more than just the primary failed. So when the 19th Amendment came up for a vote in Congress in the summer, Texas women, who are now voters, initiated a letter-writing campaign to their representatives in Washington, reminding them of their new voting power. Carrie Catt called this the heavy artillery down in Texas. And the state's congressional delegation voted for the amendment, helping to assure its success. Governor Hobby, who is now in debt to Texas women for his victory, <laughs> 
called a special session of the legislature to vote on the ratification of the new amendment. The House and the Senate both voted yes in June 1919, and Governor Hobby signed the decree, making Texas the first southern state to ratify the amendment and the ninth in the nation. Now, before I close, I want to tell you about how TWU fits, fits into this story, and you've, we've already heard some of this. You'll remember that during the 1890s, when urban areas were growing and rural isolation was decreasing, Texas women claimed public space for themselves by forming women's clubs. They learned about lobbying, and they did that in the legislature to get what they wanted, things like education. So throughout this de decade, members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union and the Grange and the Texas Federation of Women's Clubs were lobbying uh, the state for a state-supported women's college. The legislature, as we know, authorized the school in 1901 as a two-year institution to educate young women in literature, domestic science, child care, and practical nursing. The focus on home economics was especially important because it allowed instructors to go into the homes of rural women, taking education to them. Not only did instructors teach small town women about progressive practices in childcare and nutrition and health, some were also known to have discussed this new idea of women getting the boat. Governor Joseph Sayers, who chose Denton as the college's permanent home, had progressive ideas too. And as a regent of the University of Texas in 1917, he was one of those who opposed Jim Ferguson's attempt to gut the faculty. Furthermore, as we've also heard, three women were members of TWU's original Board of Regents, and they were the first women to serve as regents anywhere in Texas, right here. And, <laughs> right. And they were all suffragists. And so here's a picture of Eliza Birdie Johnson, who was head of the statewide Texas Federation of Women's Clubs. The second was Helen Stoddard, who had been the president of the WCTU for 16 years. And she also supported pure food laws, raising the age of sexual consent for teenage girls, and she opposed child labor laws. The third was Eleanor Brackenridge from San Antonio, who had encouraged her own woman's club there in San Antonio to move away from literature and towards social reform. She became the president of the statewide Texas Equal Suffrage Association, and many fish said that Brackenridge's leadership had taken the curse off suffrage in Texas. So I think this lineage makes the creation and growth of TWU not just interesting, but really emblematic of the most active early period of reform in women's rights in Texas. In conclusion, it took over 70 years nationally and over 50 years in Texas to get that little three-letter word, sex, written into the Constitution. But that didn't mark the end of the suffrage movement. Voter suppression still exists, and the Voting Rights Act is in need of repair. But at least we know that important change does happen when enough people put their minds to it for long enough and they don't give up. Thank you. <laughs>